I'm a senior UX designer at Honeywell, co-organizer of Ladies.UX Atlanta, and a design mentor here at ADP List. I'm also super excited and jazzed to be your host for this event series called Genius Hours, Career Success Edition. So this is a series of events where design mentors come together to provide tips and insights into the how-tos and what should I do's of building and growing a successful career. So for today, we'll be learning about networking and job seeking during these COVID times. So 2020 was of course an unprecedented year that impacted all of us in some way. And it definitely affected how we as design professionals connect with each other and find opportunities to grow ourselves and our careers. So our speakers today, Christine Yuen, Katie Jacquet, and Antonio Song will share firsthand experiences of their struggles with job hunting during the recession and what they did to eventually land their jobs. So they will focus primarily on best practices around networking, how to message your personal story, and how to set yourself up for success in this newly remote global environment. So let's get started. Christine, Katie, and Antonio, if you can unmute yourselves and give a short intro, who you are, your role, what you're all about, and then we'll kick it off. Sounds good. Thanks, Yang. Um, Katie, I wasn't sure if you're going to pull up the slides, but um, yeah, but hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. My, um, my name is Christine. I'm a design manager at LinkedIn. Um, I've also got with me Katie Jacquet and Antonio Song, who are also designers at LinkedIn. Um, we're going to share a little bit more about our stories in a bit, but what we wanted to cover with all of you today is just some um, key tips that we've learned through our experiences around networking and specifically networking during COVID. So like kind of moving to this online remote world and how you can be a little bit more successful with your job hunt. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. So um, just starting off to kind of share more about my background. Um, so for those who uh, don't know me, um, might not know that I actually studied business in my undergraduate. And um, I was graduating around 2010. And I was like in the midst of internship hunting during that great global recession that we had in 2008 and 2009 when the financial markets crashed. And as a business student, it was really horrible to try to find any job. Um, you know, I remember being at the career fair at Notre Dame, uh, which is where I went for my undergrad, standing in very long lines, just to talk to recruiters to find out that they might only have one position open or they weren't even doing internships or like new hire uh, positions at all. So, you know, it was a little disheartening during that time, but one of the things that kind of stuck, like stuck out to me and I learned a lot in my journey was that it was actually really important to network with companies that I wanted to work for. And at that time I wanted to go into consulting. So even though I didn't have offers at like Deloitte Consulting, Accenture, or, you know, the other top firms, I spent a lot of time in 2008 networking and staying in touch with them over the year by going to their events, you know, meeting people from those different firms. And when it came time to graduating in 2010, I was lucky enough to uh, land a couple of different jobs at consulting firms. And that's kind of how I started my job at Deloitte. Um, but with that, I hope that kind of story resonates with all of you who might be students who are looking for internships or full-time roles now, um, because, you know, we've all been there um, and it's tough, but networking is very powerful and can open a lot of doors for you later down the line. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my story. My name's Katie, and similar to Christine, I graduated around the time of the Great Recession in 2009 um, and found my way into design in a very non-linear fashion. Um, so I actually started studying fine arts in undergrad, and I thought I wanted to be a photographer, which is you know, what I'm doing in uh, this photograph. Um, but that path didn't necessarily pan out for me. Um, I took a really great internship one summer as a photographer, I had paid housing, really good hourly wage, and was working in an awesome studio with really great photo equipment, um, but the material I was shooting really wasn't that exciting. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the company Uline. If you haven't, you've definitely used their products. They basically sell like packaging uh, equipment like boxes and plastic bags. And that's what I spent my summer photographing. Needless to say, it wasn't that inspirational. Um, so at the end of the, the internship, I went back to um, grad school uh, 
and was really excited about interactive art and the web. So I was studying fine arts. I spent my thesis creating inter interactive light installation. And at that moment, I knew I kind of wanted to work in some sort of interactive space. So after graduation, without a job, I drove from Michigan to San Francisco to work on web-based products. Um, my first job out of school was as a marketer managing brand digital presence online. So I actually worked for Clorox and similar to Procter & Gamble, they have a bunch of products underneath them. So I managed Hidden Valley Ranch, Kingsford Charcoal, and managed their digital presence online. Um, I just saw someone post that you used to get Uline catalogs. You've probably seen my work. <laughs> um, so anyway, after uh, um, kind of working in uh, marketing, I wasn't working as a designer, but I was still in an adjacent space or so had the opportunity to work with professional creatives and designers, which is where I learned um, that I really wanted to get into UX design. So I went to California College of the Arts, which is actually where I met Christine and kind of found my way um, into design that way. So my journey had a lot of pivots, um, but each of these pivots has kind of woven itself into my story as a designer. And I now bill myself as a designer and ex-marketer. So I bring what I did as a marketer into my job today, building products for uh, des uh, products for marketers on LinkedIn. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Antonio. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Antonio and I very recently graduated. I'm a class of 2020 graduate, so graduated last year during COVID. And uh, I was initially an information systems major. I wasn't in the design program. So I wasn't, I didn't come into college thinking I would be a product designer. But as I sort of took classes and figured out my interests, I, sort of pivoted or, or declared a double major in human computer interaction because I realized in the middle, uh, product design is something that I wanted to do for my career. Uh, but also I'm an international student. Uh, I come, originally come from South Korea and I went to middle school and high school in Beijing, China. So coming to the US was the first time I stepped my foot in the United States. And if there are any international students in this call, you all know that F1, student visa uh, students have it harder for in terms of recruiting. Uh, we have to be very selective about uh, which, uh, which companies to interview for because not all companies uh, sponsor our work visas and uh, green card for permanent residency after the H-1B expires. So um, I had to very carefully strategize my application process uh, based around searching for companies that do sponsor uh, H-1B visas and uh, green cards. Cool, so that's a little bit more about us, but um, you know, hopefully that gives you all kind of a mindset of where we're coming from too. We completely empathize with everybody who's like struggling with the job search right now. So our goal in this presentation is to really just give you guys some tips uh, around how to network remotely, engage with your network and looking for opportunities. So I wanted to start off to talk a little bit more about the current state of the economy um, to give you guys some perspectives of what's going on. Um, so at LinkedIn, we do collect a lot of economic data. We actually have a team of economists that are like constantly measuring to see where the state of jobs are, where, how industries are trending. And um, you know, compared to when Katie and I last did this presentation, um, it's actually, there's been quite a few improvements. If you can see here on the chart below, like the orange line is kind of uh, where we are versus the black line, which was like the previous year. Um, but hiring is essentially almost back up to where it was pre-COVID. Um, so compared to the summer, which was, it was really tough, especially for a lot of students who are graduating. And I think the state of the economy will continually improve uh, within the next few months because there's more um, stimulus money that's being pumped in, the vaccine is coming out, the warmer weather will hopefully like, you know, kind of like mitigate the virus. So um, that's, those are all really positive outlooks for the industry in general. And um, in fact, what we've been seeing too is that a lot of companies who weren't hiring last year are starting to come out of the hiring freezes with the new fiscal year. So starting in January and February, a lot of them are starting to get new budgets and stuff like that and are opening up more headcount, which will be happening within the next few months. 
Um, and then with the, you know, with the upshot with everything in the economy is you might be curious, like not every industry has fully recovered, but there are some that are doing really well. I won't go into a ton of detail on the left, but, you know, these are some of the, the top employers that we found at LinkedIn who are currently hiring a lot, whether across all industries or the tech industry. The other trends that we've been seeing is that even though people are going remote, we've actually seen a lot of heavy investment in terms of people using uh, social media, digital platforms to really connect with each other, which can be used to your advantage if you're looking for a job, because now it kind of opens up a lot of opportunities versus being limited by a geographic location in the past. And then industries that weren't doing so well last year, um, such as retail and manufacturing, are actually um, starting to rebound quite a bit on top of like the tech industries, delivery services and stuff that's already, um, that was already doing well in the pandemic. So essentially with all of the data that I'm trying to show you is that, you know, the world is really different. There's been a lot of change in the last year. So for you to be successful in finding a new job or like, you know, an opportunity, you have to adapt to this new normal in order to succeed with like the way that the world is moving. All right. Um, thanks, Christine, for that background. So next, I'm going to be talking to you more about networking remotely and how you can use LinkedIn to actually do this. Um, so I think we tend to think about networking only when we need a job, but connecting with other professionals and professional creatives can actually benefit you throughout your career. So I want to give you an example. Um, I was actually recruited to LinkedIn by Christine. Um, and as it turns out, I actually interviewed Antonio when he was interviewing. So there's a nice connection there. Um, but specific to my connection with Christine, uh, our connection first started when she visited my graduate program and spoke to my class. Um, we were the second cohort. She was the first. We were guinea pigs. We were working on projects and didn't really know what we were doing. So it was great to have somebody come in and kind of coach us along the way. And that's how our connection started, but progressed as she gave me portfolio advice and then offered to mentor me as I uh, kind of talked to other companies and was trying to figure out what type of organization I should work for. So as we were kind of continuing this connection, um, there were a couple jobs that came available at LinkedIn and she recommended that I apply for them um, and eventually it turned into a job. But what's important is that our connection actually first started really organically. Um, so just a couple tips in terms of how to go about networking. Um, if you are just starting out, networking can be a lengthy process. So from the time I first met Christine until uh, the job um, offer, I think was like six months to a year. So it can take a while, but it can pay out. Um, because it can take a while and it is a lengthy process, you may need to meet lots of different people to reach your goal. Uh, the secondary thing is that you want to be really clear on what your goals are and start as early as possible. So maybe your portfolio is not ready. That's okay. Um, it's never too early to start networking. So why is networking important? Um, this might be a redundant question or maybe a dumb question, but I think there's a couple things to point out. Um, networking is really important because it can provide you visibility. So uh, when companies start hiring and we are, as Christine pointed out, they are starting to hire again, which is great. Um, people in your network will have you top of mind if they know that you're job seeking. So again, to get back to that uh, example with Christine, um, Christine was coaching me on my portfolio when I was in grad school and told me about some associate design roles, which, and suggested I apply, um, which provided visibility, which is that first point. Um, she then referred me to a hiring manager, which gave me access to the right people, the hiring managers. And then finally, I received a personal um, connection, which helped me stand out from the crowd that provided some attention to me. Uh, the, the truth is sometimes for these design roles, they can be highly competitive. So in my case, there were two associate design positions available, but over 400 people applied. And so while having that recommendation didn't guarantee that I was going to get the job at all, it at least helped uh, help make sure that someone saw my application. Um, all right, so given that networking should be strategic, uh, the first thing that you wanna do is define your approach and your strategy. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this process. We're all designers here. Um, this is the double diamond process and you could actually use a double design, sorry, double diamond process and apply it to any problem. So in this case, we're going to apply it to job seeking. 
Um, so there are four different phases to the double diamond and I will match the phases to the job seeking process. So at the onset, um, you wanna make sure you define your learning objectives. What do you wanna get out of networking? Uh, so maybe you wanna understand if you wanna work at an agency or if you wanna work uh, for a large in-house organization or a tech company. Um, so once you kind of figure out what you wanna learn, you can go out and gather data. And so that can be secondary or desk research or primary research by going out and talking to people. Um, these conversations can help you to find what your hypothesis is. So maybe your hypothesis at the end of this is, all right, I think I'm gonna be happy working for an agency. Then what you need to do is come up with a bunch of ideas uh, that are low risk. And by low risk, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, so maybe an idea, if you think you might be happy at an agency, is taking on an agency-esque project outside of work or outside of class, or maybe asking a contact at an agency to let you sit in on a creative review. Um, from there, you can kind of ratchet up the fidelity of your ideas uh, until something is like high risk. So maybe if you're a student, a really high risk idea um, or the final prototype can be getting an internship. All right, so next up, I wanna talk really briefly about your LinkedIn profile. Um, I think Christine came a couple of weeks ago to talk about the LinkedIn profile. So we're just gonna highlight the most important parts. Um, so as you start to network, there are some best practices that you should, should put into play to help you in your networking. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the top card, which is what we're looking at here. And this is at the very top. Um, so I'm sure you've heard this before, uh, but when you meet somebody, they say you have 10 seconds to make a good first impression. It's the same thing with your LinkedIn profile. Um, you wanna put your best foot forward uh, so that the first thing somebody sees they understand what you're about and you're making a good impression. Um, so there's two areas I wanna call out here in the top card. The first one is the background cover photo, which shows something that you're passionate about as Harrison has done here. Um, the second part that I wanna call out is the headline. So Harrison's actually my design manager and he has that in his title, uh, but he also has uh, a podcast that he's the host of Technically Speaking. Um, Y'all should check it out if you haven't already and he highlights that here. So you can use this to highlight one or multiple roles. Um, so what's cool is that this doesn't have to be like all work all the time. It can include and infuse some of your personality into it. Uh, the other section I wanna talk about is your experience. Um, again, we're all creatives here. So we understand the importance of um, a picture and how valuable it is to show your work. And so when you're thinking about your experience, you can actually embed rich media assets into here so uh, photos, videos, et cetera, um, to really show the type of work that you've done. The next section I wanna talk about is, your, is this skill section. And this is at the very bottom of your uh, profile. And this is um, probably one of my favorite sections and something that before I worked at LinkedIn, I totally skipped over. Um, but the reason it's important and the reason I like it so much is that this actually correlates to a search engine. So um, let's say you're going for UX design roles. You wanna make sure you include UX related terms here, like information architecture, systems thinking, et cetera. Um, and so what we know is that uh, people with five or more skills receive up to 27 times more appearances in search results. Um, so to give you an example, if I'm a recruiter and I'm looking for UX designers who can do wireframing, prototyping and systems thinking, and you have these skills, then you're going to show up in my search results. Um, this is especially important for career shifters uh, and I experienced this firsthand. So I went from marketing to UX design. And as I was kind of navigating that shift, I was still getting a lot of job uh, offer or, uh, recommendations to apply for jobs or interview for marketing jobs. But yet I was going for UX design. And once I updated my profile and specifically the skills section to reflect my new UX design skills, I started to get way more um, UX related jobs. So um, I recommend updating the section. All right, so the next section, we'll talk about finding some networking opportunities online. Um, so pre-COVID, a, a lot of networking happened at in-person events. So pre-COVID, this event might happen um, in person, but for obvious reasons, that's not happening anymore. And these events are happening virtually. Like, I think there's over 120 people on this call right now with people from all over the globe, which is pretty amazing. And that's never, you know, didn't happen before. 
Um, these types of events are still actually a really great, great way to network with people. And the way you can do that is, um, you know, doing what you're doing now, engaging with, engaging in the chat, uh, asking questions to presenters, finding other interesting people that you can connect with. Um, in terms of these events, you can actually find them online. You know, you're here, so you know how to find events, but you can find them on Facebook, Meetup, Eventbrite. Uh, but LinkedIn also recently launched events, um, so you can uh, you can find some remote excuse me remote events online too. All right, so beyond events, you can actually use digital tools to find people you have a common connection with. Um, some easy connections are people that you already know uh, from like past colleagues, from past jobs, professors or classmates, um, and also friends that you have in, in real life too. Um, if you are looking to grow your network outside of your immediate contacts, you can actually uh, find a common connection with somebody by going to um, the alumni or people tab of a school or company page. Um, and this is where you can find a common connection. So for example, when I was in grad school, I was really interested in Google X, uh, but I didn't know anybody in my personal network that worked there. So what I did is I went to the um, uh, page for California College of the Arts, looked at their alumni base, and then found people that work at Google. So when you click on this, you can actually see people that fit that. Um, and then you know, subsequently you can reach out to them and have a common connection with them, which I'll talk about next. So when you are ready to send a request to somebody, um, there's a couple different ways that you can, there's two ways you can reach out on desktop or on mobile. Um, but when you do reach out, you wanna make sure you personalize that connection request. Um, so in my case with the Google connection, this would be where I would say something like, hey, went to CCA, wanna learn more about Google, are you open to having a chat? Um, I get a lot of connection requests, I'm sure you do too. If you know that person or have a common connection with that person, you're gonna be more likely to accept and respond to that connection request than if you didn't know them. Uh, just a really quick note, when you do make that connection request on mobile, there's this blue connect button, um, but resist the urge to hit the pretty blue button and hit the more button, because then that will uh, allow you to personalize the invite. If you hit connect, I think it just sends the request, request right uh, out the gate. All right, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Christine. Um, thank you, Katie. So I'm gonna go a little bit more into some specific examples of how you can better craft your story as you're reaching out to people online. So one statistic I wanna share with you all is that um, at LinkedIn, we've collected this data and found that about 85% of jobs get filled with referral. Um, that's, the, that's a pretty high number. And essentially what that means is like, it really helps to have somebody that can uh, that you can network and meet to help you with a referral to end up being more successful in your job hunt. Now, with that being said, does it mean that applying online is fruitless? No, that's not the case at all. You can still apply online if you don't have a referral or a network. Um, it's just that it's a lot more competitive and you have to be very strategic with how you're doing your material so that you get recognized when you're being compared to like, you know, thousands of applicants for a single role, for example. So one of the things that um, Katie kind of brushed on is just like being strategic when networking. So I wanted to break that down a little bit more in terms of what that means. So when you're first starting off with networking, it's important to plan. So think about like, what are the companies or industries that you work with? And don't just focus on the ones with open jobs. Um, because like, you know, with COVID, a lot of them are just coming out of a hiring freeze or they might not have those associate designer roles that you're looking for, but they might open them up in 2021 or 2022. So it's still worth building those connections with those people when you are ready. Um, uh, you can always like, you know, find that opportunity later on. The second point is that it's important to find the right people to reach out to. A lot of people I talk to sometimes assume that recruiters are absolutely the best people to talk to. Um, and in some instances, yes, they do have, you know, the access to the jobs and everything and know exactly the criteria that they're looking for. But on the opposite side, they're super busy with lots of requests. So maybe instead of think, focusing on just recruiters, you should try to aim for the hiring managers who have direct access to these roles as well, or other designers on the team who might be, you know, looking for a fellow colleague to bring on board. Or even if you have like a friend who is like an engineer or somebody who works in the company, that is still a valuable connection to have when you're networking. And then um, when you're talking to people, again, it's important to have a clear goal in mind in terms of what you want to gain out of that uh, 
discussion. The second thing you want to think about is curating. And what I mean by that is like your messages. So what's really important is that you do not want to be generic and kind of apply a one size fits all strategy for every company or every type of job role that you find out there. It's important to personalize and find common ground with the people that you're meeting um, because that actually builds empathy with them and makes them feel more connected to help you as part of the process. It's also important to demonstrate some value um, that you can bring, like whether it's a a set of skills or a particular interest area before you directly start asking for things like, you know, feedback on a portfolio or a referral, um, because then it kind of helps set the groundwork for, again, like why they should be helping you. The last thing to think about is your delivery. So when um, you're kind of writing networking messages to people online, especially, it's important to keep it brief. Um, Sometimes these people get a lot of messages. So it's hard to read through like really long ones. And then the other time is because we get a lot of messages, um, it's important to be very clear about your ask. So that means directly asking a question because if not, it's easy to gloss over it. And then the last thing is just remembering keeping a professional tone and also a kind tone, understanding that these people can be very busy at times. So some general high level tips I wanna give around networking is that you know when you're doing it for the first time, um, approach networking like you're making a new friend. I know it can be scary when you're talking to somebody in a position of power at a company, but not everything has to be completely transactional. Um, and it's okay if they again they don't have an open job, but if you just want to like approach it with curiosity and like genuineness, um, people are more open to talking to you and facilitating that conversation and keeping that uh, a relationship going. The other thing that's really important is that you should always start building your relationships before you even need a job. A lot of the time I see students making the mistake where like they're graduating and they need to find a job now. So they start networking. But like Katie said earlier, it requires a lot of time to build up these relationships. So I, if you're a student now, I highly encourage you doing it even before you have a portfolio just to start kind of understanding the different fields that you want. And then maintaining the relationship is important too. So I wanted to next go through some examples of some uh, well-curated messages. So this one on the left is one that I received in my um, inbox uh, a few months ago that I thought was like really well-written and I'll kind of break it down as to why. So the first part is that uh, this person sent a message that really found common ground. Um, I do a lot of speaking events, for example, so it's it's sometimes hard for me to remember where I met somebody, but he's really good at articulating the exact event that um, he met me at, both in the title and kind of in the beginning of the sentence that he writes. The second part is that he does a really good job with building empathy. So um, it helps me feel compelled to help him. He talks a lot about like, you know, his struggles with COVID, and kind of switching from like, you know, a different type of career um, and trying to figure that out to find a strategy that resonates. And me, myself being a career shifter really resonated with me and what made me want to help this person. The other thing is that he was very clear about his objective in terms of what he wanted to discuss with me. And he stated it in the form of a question. So it was very clear if I was able to be able to even give this person advice, or if not, you know, I can at least direct him to somebody in my network who would be able to. And then lastly, like, I really liked that it's very professional and kind. It's not very demanding. And he's completely understands that if I'm like very busy, um, you know, it's, it's totally fine. But this is like a really well-structured message that I would recommend people thinking about as you're kind of writing networking messages for the first time. So um, I also wanna show you guys some ones that I've received in the past that could use some improvements. Um, And by no means is this meant to shame the person who's writing the message. We all make mistakes, Um, but I think it's important to see some things to watch out for so that all of you on the call can uh, be conscious of trying to avoid these things too, so that you can become a better networker. So the first one in this message specifically, um, there's a lot of misspellings and grammatical mistakes. Um, First of all, this person starts off with like uh, not writing my name correctly, which kind of sets things in the wrong foot. And additionally, you know, there's there's certain things that I'm not quite sure in terms of what they're asking for. Um, I think in this instance in particular, English might not have been their first language, which is totally fine. 
But I think if you know if you know that's some a weak area of yours or, or the area that you'd like to improve, ask a friend or somebody or use like Grammarly or something like that to try to check your messages before sending it out. Um, in this other message, the the first thing that um, kind of caught my attention was that there wasn't a really clear sense of connection. Um, I know that they wanted to connect with me, but I wasn't sure as to why. The other part of the message was that it felt a little forward. And it was a large commitment. Um, this person starts off asking for direct feedback in their portfolio, and I hadn't even met them in the past. So it's kind of hard for me to give like that kind of contextual feedback um, and take time out of my day without like feeling really compelled and connected to this individual. And then the last part is that it's a little unclear what is the specific ask that they wanted. Is it a portfolio review? Is it learning more about opportunities? Um, it, it wasn't really stated as a clear question either. So it just kind of let me confused in terms of how I can help this person um, is just the key, key takeaway there. All right, so um, for the essence of time, I wanted to do a networking exercise with everyone, but I don't know if we uh, will, so I'll just kind of fly through this really quickly. Um, but I wanted to show you all another example. So this, um, let me tell the story of this person. So this person I was mentoring on ADP list of actually still am. Um, and for this specific person, he was using the message that you see here on the left-hand side and was using it to reach out to uh, a bunch of different companies. Um, and unfortunately, with the message that he was sending on the left-hand side, he wasn't getting very many responses. I think he told me he, before his session with me, he had like sent this out to almost a hundred companies and he maybe only heard back like five or six different people. Um, so immediately I asked him to take a look at his messages in terms of how he's crafting them and reaching out to people online and um, I wanted to give him some more tangible feedback. So if you can see on the right-hand side, I highlighted some things that are like very clear things that he could have improved on that uh, changed the way that his message was written. I think the first part, is, um, when he was writing his message, um, it was a little forward with his portfolio. It was like, here are my materials, um, please take a look at it. So now it's kind of changed in tone where it's more about like, if you have a, if you want to learn more about me, here are my materials that you can take a look at. The other thing is that in the second paragraph, um, he wrote a little bit more about the specific connection that he had with the individual. So whether that was like the location that they grew up in, um, their major, something like that really connected them with that individual. And then the last part was again, a direct question. Um, asking about like, you know, would you have time to talk to me to understand more about your different, you know, the different opportunities that you have. And this made a massive difference. Um, after he made these changes, he started getting responses immediately back within the week um, when he was reaching out to different folks. So with those examples, hopefully that kind of gives you a perspective of like, the different ranges and how you can craft your message so that it's noticed to the different types of people that you're trying to network with online. Um, I also wanna just to leave you all with this in this section is that you know with networking, obviously LinkedIn is a really great tool and ADP list as well is a really great place and community, but it's not the only place. So these are some other um, UX groups that I've found Katie and Antonio as well that have been really helpful for people. So I'd highly recommend you all to just like, you know, cast a wide net, try to meet as many folks as possible from all these different types of organizations. And you never know where it could land and help you with your next opportunity. So with that, I'll pass it off to Antonio. Thanks, Christine. So now that you've established a relationship with someone, uh, how do you actually maintain the relationship? Because uh, maintaining a relationship is as important as establishing one. So once you have that connection, uh, the whole point is that in, in any time of the future, you can reach out to that person again uh, to receive help. So for example, uh, this is a screenshot of a message that Katie uh, received. Uh, the, the sender found the common ground and reminded her that uh, when and where they met. Uh, they met at SF Design Week. And that's, that's an immediate connection you can establish uh, for, from you and the person who you're sending the message to. And similar to the points you saw before, she sent a short message that was 
very clear about what her request was. Uh, in this case, she wanted some help on her uh, personal UX project. And she was also being very considerate of, of other person's time. You know, since I worked, started working at LinkedIn, um, I've been getting a lot of messages uh, every day. And, you know, as someone who works from nine to five every day, it does get very over overwhelming. And oftentimes I don't get to reply to all the messages. So uh, when there's people who are being considerate of my time, um, I tend to appreciate them a lot and more likely to reply to them as well. And like, uh, like I just said, it's totally okay to follow up again if you don't receive a reply, because oftentimes it might be just that we just got a lot of messages one day and we might have to simply miss out. Now, uh, once you've found the, let's talk about like how you can ask for referrals when you find a role uh, you might be interested on LinkedIn. Uh, there is a feature on LinkedIn where you can directly ask, some, ask for a referral from someone. Uh, LinkedIn will automatically identify uh, someone's who, someone who's in your network uh, who works at the place that you're trying to apply to. Uh, and like Christy mentioned earlier, referral gives you a huge advantage of, uh, over other candidates. Uh, so when you're applying for a job, uh, you can ask for referrals, but we really recommend you speak to the person who you're asking the referral for first and establish that connection there. I know something popular among students these days uh, is they use this platform ADP list uh, and they try to um, establish connection through that way. Uh, I think ADP list is a really good way to do that. Um, some strategies my friends uh, who are still in school uh, successfully used is uh, they like to receive portfolio feedback from a lot of the mentors on ADP list. Uh, and then oftentimes, uh, when you're applying to a company, uh, there is a mentor from that company as well. So you would receive portfolio critique from them. And at the end of the critique uh, that you can ask, casually ask, uh, I, I saw a position open at your company for an internship or a new grad role. And you can casually mention, uh, is it possible to get a referral uh, for this role? And most likely that person, since that person just went through your portfolio with you for 30 minutes or so, uh, you're more likely to successfully receive that referral for that role. Now, engaging with your network is also important because it is the best way to get attention from your peers and recruiters who are on LinkedIn. Uh, let's break down how LinkedIn social media algorithm works. Uh, on the LinkedIn platform, the more you engage with the content, uh, the more uh, visibility you'll get throughout the platform. For example, if you share an article or post a, post a story, whether you post a comment, reach out to people on messages, uh, applying for jobs, all of these things will move the algorithm a little more so that you personally will get higher visibility uh, on everyone else's feed. So, uh, the best way to stand out on social media is start posting as often as you can, start interacting with other people as much as you can. Uh, that can be a post, a comment, message, uh, anything you're comfortable with. Now, I know that uh, a lot of people find it very difficult to uh, post on LinkedIn, especially because it's a social, uh, it's a professional social network. You want to present the best part of yourself. And I had the same problem too. Like I would casually post on Facebook or Instagram pretty often, but LinkedIn posting was something that I also hesitated a lot before doing it regularly. But there are some very easy ways that you can utilize to get started. Uh, at CMU, uh, I had classes where they made me write some articles on certain topics. Uh, so what if, you don't finish just by submitting it to your professor, but also post it on your LinkedIn. Or whether uh, if you attend like a virtual event or a workshop like this one, um, you could totally write like a small review or, or, or an article about what you learned in the event and make that into an article and post it on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can also see on the bottom right, this is a project that I did uh, during COVID times. It was my last semester of CMU and everything was closed down. All the classes were remote and a friend, my friend and I got really bored. So we started a little side project 
on how, how can we make the Zoom experience a little better? So we did that project and we were like, hey, maybe we can post it on LinkedIn to, to show it to the design community. Uh, what, it, what ended up happening is a couple of MBA students from MIT saw this project and thought it was very cool. So what I did was just create like a visual uh, case study of what I, what I think would be a good feature. But now this feature actually exists as a real product. Uh, you can go to getblue.com, uh, I'll put in the link. But now they actually uh, have a startup company based on this idea. And they reached out to me and uh, tried to recruit me as a designer. Of course, I had a LinkedIn, so I turned them down. But this is a prime example of you can you posting your own project and having visibility so other people can notice you. Now, creating a personal story can be also a very good way of doing it. Um, it is intimidating, but remind to remind all of you, all of our story can be woven into a, an enticing story for anyone. You know, you might have struggled, uh, experienced struggles here and there, or you might have had successes here and there. And all of these things are relatable to someone on LinkedIn. So in this particular screenshot, uh, in this example, uh, this, fresh college, this, this college freshman uh, started out feeling like there are so many people who are more successful than him. And that feeling of being unsure and not confident about yourself is something that everyone can relate to. Now, what he did was he ended up reaching out to people that he found inspiring from LinkedIn, uh, who, who he calls uh, LinkedIn stars here. And he ended up saying that one of the person uh, who he reached out to ended up changing his, his career. And these kind of stories, uh, it helps people understand that other people are also feeling the same things. And people relate to these kind of strugg personal struggles. So these kind of posts, the reason why they get so many uh, engagements, like a lot of likes and comments, is because they are personally struggling with the similar issues as well. And these kind of sharing your personal story can also help you build engagement on the platform. Now, other than a generic post, you can also get creative and create a maybe a video of something you've made. Uh, this particular post I ran into today is uh, someone experimenting with uh, AR kit on iPhone. Uh, it was a really cool thing to watch. Normally, I would just scroll down the feed, but this one immediately, it immediately caught my eye because it was a moving, you know, video with interactive uh, particles in the air. So it, it was really cool. And naturally, it has a lot of likes and comments too. So try try different formats as well. Uh, there's another uh, format, which is a long form article. Uh, on LinkedIn, there's a feature to write articles natively on the platform. And this particular article was a uh, article written after one of our LinkedIn uh, talks as well. So you can you can totally write an article after this talk as well and, and summarize your learnings and experiences. So others who didn't attend can also learn from you. And this is important because it helps your posts reach a wider audience. Uh, AKA getting virality on your posts. So make sure when you're posting, your privacy setting isn't set to connections only, but instead set to public. You know, it's, it's a simple thing, but you might not have noticed before. Uh, also use app mentions for, for people or companies uh, that are relevant to the content you're writing about. And also hashtags. Uh, hashtags help a lot because a lot of people follow hashtags and those hashtag posts will show on their feed as well. So when I personally post, I also include hashtags like design, product design, UX design, uh, to make sure that my post is getting to the right audiences. And also add links, photos, or videos to the posts. We, we have a statistic uh, saying that re uh, regular posts with only text get less engagement than rich posts that have videos or photos or links. Uh, so make sure you can make your post like stand out as much as possible by adding these things. Now, uh, I will briefly touch upon how to look for opportunities during COVID times because it can be challenging. 
I think what I want to say here is it's totally fine if you don't land your perfect internship or job on the on your first try. There are so many other opportunities that you can leverage in the meantime to help you get to where you want to get to. So one prime example is volunteering. Um, there are a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations that require that needs help building their products, but uh, cannot really uh, afford to pay like full time designers. Uh, you can also find hackathons. Uh, I know a lot of organizations in the U.S. holding hackathons uh, every month. Uh, you can join a team with engineers who, who require design help in building their projects. Uh, from my experience, I've done two or three hackathons before. And most of the times, these hackathons would be a lot of engineers, but not as much uh, designers compared to the engineers. And that makes designers very attractive in those hackathons because everyone wants their projects to be, be successful. Um, so hackathon is another way, or you could also identify your own op opportunity. Like, like my side project that I did with Zoom, um, it wasn't a class project. It wasn't really a hackathon. It was just something that I felt uh, could help everyone uh, when they use uh, Zoom for a video conference. So I just did it for fun on my part time. And even that led to an un unexpected opportunity for me so you could totally uh, create your own opportunity as well. But to dive a little deeper into volunteering, um, there are lots of companies or, and organizations that need help, especially because of COVID-19 right now. And I, I saw in the chat, someone asked, what's a good place to find uh, volunteering opportunities? So one is helpwithcovid.com. There are a lot of projects uh, related to COVID-19 uh, published by companies and nonprofits that are looking for help. Another one is Tech for America. It's, it's a chance to volunteer and build websites for small businesses that need help. Another one is Develop for Good. So uh, Develop for Good is a big organization that connects students and recent grads with nonprofit organizations that need help with product development. And this is this one I put in there because I'm participating there as a product design mentor. Uh, so right now I'm mentoring two groups uh, that are working for uh, racial injustice and WHO actually. So this is a very good organization to to sort of sign up for if you need more projects under your belt. So we've reached the end of the presentation. Uh, just to summarize, there are four takeaways that we can take away from here. Uh, first is network as much as possible and as early as possible. Uh, stay up to date with your connections and use them to your advantage when you need them. Uh, number two is engage your network by posting and joining conversations on LinkedIn and other social media. Uh, as I told you, the algorithm favors people who engage more often than others who don't. So use that to your advantage. And third is be proactive with your job hunt and use COVID related resources. Uh, there are so many people out there who need help, so many organizations out there who need help. So actively look out for these opportunities because all of these opportunities will help you become a stronger designer and help you build a stronger portfolio. And finally, find volunteering or self-sourced projects. Uh, yeah, like like the similar one here, uh, most likely the perfect internship or the perfect new get role you're looking for requires you to demonstrate certain ability or certain skills uh, to, to get there. And if you feel like you're not getting there, you're getting rejected all the time. Uh, in the meantime, you can definitely uh, volunteer or do self-source projects to help you uh, get you closer there. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, thank everyone, and my co-presenters, Christine and Katie, and thanks to ADP List for hosting us. Uh, anyone, if you have any questions, we'll take them in the chat, or if we have time, we're doing Q&A session, right? So. Yeah, I believe we thanks. definitely have time, and I'll be keeping an eye on the clock. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing so much knowledge. The chat is like blowing up with like 
cross conversations going on and a lot of great insights. So definitely we're gonna kick off the Q and A. So uh, Sudeshna asked, when job searching, one may be suitable for multiple roles. So how can you position yourself without hampering you know, other potential opportunities? Yeah, so I'll start with that one. Um, and I think what's really important is that if you wanna go for like say a designer role and then a research role and a design strategist role, like they're all actually very different things. So I highly recommend to people who are trying to go that wide of a range to actually have um, resumes that are catered for those specific jobs with the keywords that are required for those specific jobs. Um, if you have a portfolio, try to segment your portfolio Either I've seen people do different sites or they have different sub tabs navigation that can direct people to those specific aspects of the portfolio. And the same with the messages when you're reaching out to people writing cover letters or like networking messages, don't copy and paste the same message generically to everyone, it will not work. You need to make sure that it's catered specifically to that role and the skill set and that person uh, for you to be successful if you're going to go with that strategy. Definitely, those pinpoints of connection is really gonna help stand out from the, the sea of connection requests that you may be getting. Okay, we have a question from Sylvia. So they said, uh, I have a strong academic research background and then asked, I'm really curious about whether any of you have advice for a new grad with a lot of academic experience trying to enter into the industry. So how would you frame the work? Is it important to do projects that are more explicitly relatable to the kinds of tasks I might be uh, asked to do in a corporate role. I can um, start with that. And then Antonio and Christine, feel free to chime in. Um, so I think, you know, anytime you're coming out of school or you're, or in my case, I was a career shifter from marketing to design. Um, I had to figure out how to um, make my background relatable and show that I had those certain skills. So in, um, in my experience, I, as a marketer, I did a lot of research and I knew that was a really important part of user experience design. So I, you know, I took my experience and my LinkedIn profile and then curated it um, to make it resonate with somebody and show uh, somebody being a hiring manager and show that I actually had some adjacent experience. So I think in like an academic setting, like graduate school um, or yeah, graduate school, um, you can tailor the work you did for your projects in a similar way. So again, maybe you focused on research, maybe you did some sketching and prototyping. Um, I, you can still surface those out. And I found it can be really hard to kind of figure out what are those skills that you should highlight. So one thing that's really helpful is just to have uh, another person there that you can kind of talk about your experience who has the job that you want to go for. And then they can help you figure out what pieces you should pull out um, and curate in your uh, experience section or your resume. Sounds like solid plus ones from Christine. <laughs> <laughs> I heard like vigorous head nods. Yeah. We have a question from Pooja who asked, what is the best way to maintain your network remotely? Like, is there a sweet spot in terms of how often you reach back out to people in your network and how often you should post on social media? Yeah, so I think in terms of how often you should reach out to that like specific person you've connected with, um, it's actually good to just ask them. Like if you're having that initial conversation, um, when you think about ending it, always think about the next steps, right? Like what can I do to continue this relationship? And sometimes you can just ask them like, you know, I really enjoyed my conversation with you today. Um, I'd love to reach out to you again in the future. Is that okay with you? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Like. Um, you know, and, and kind of figure it out from there. Um, and the other part of your question in terms of posting, how frequently should you do it? Well, um, I think posting as often as possible is good, but also don't force it, right? Don't write like superficial content um, or things that feel inauthentic um, because you're just trying to post daily. Like for me, myself, I try to post maybe every two weeks or something like that, um, depending on what I have going on. There's some weeks that might be happening more frequently. Um, but yeah, but I think you want to just get into the habit of like either writing a unique post. You can also reshare content. So if you don't want to write your own content, if you see we follow a thought leader that you find really compelling, um, sometimes resharing their stuff is also a way of posting and kind of engaging with your audience, too. So that that also is very effective. 
Yeah, I definitely want to add to that in terms of that, that frequency and that rhythm, it is up to you to determine what schedule works well for you. You don't want to feel like you're locked in on like, this is the ideal frequency of posting and not feel motivated to do it. Um, so it, it, it may not have to be every day, it may not, it may be once a week, once a month, but it's the quality of that post. Okay, <laughs> this question from uh, D. Kim, how do you start networking without feeling superficial? Something um, I can tell is when I was a junior and I was in the midst of applying for different internships, I, I did a lot of networking. And the best thing I tried to do is uh, sort of not trying to be too polite with the messages, like Christine said. Uh, if you're like too polite and, and you write long sentences, it, it, it sounds very superficial. So something I tried to do is uh, which was covered in the slide earlier as well, uh, looking for common points. Um, and in doing so, you can identify people with relatable backgrounds from you. So what, what I used to do is I would mainly try to focus on networking with people from my same school or my same country. So whenever I saw uh, designers, full-time designers from CMU or Korean designers working in certain companies, I would use that background uh, as a starting point of my of my networking messages, and that would give me a very good a success rate without sounding too superficial. Yeah, I, that's a really excellent point, Antonio. Um, I, I would throw it back to D Kim and be like, "How do you make friends?" Right? It's it's the same approach that you want to think about with networking. Um, maybe there's a, like, it doesn't have to be professional at all. Like you don't even have to start a networking conversation with like, oh, I want to learn about your company or your role. It could be much like, you know, if you just find out that person's just as much into food as you are, or watches the same show on Netflix, like that's a really great opener as well, because it demonstrates to that person, you are listening to them and that you care about them as a person and not necessarily just like, you know, you're, they're, you're using them as a means to get to this job that you really want. Um, and I think when you're networking with folks, that's, that's all they really want to feel on the other side. It's like that, you know, that we, we are genuinely trying to help you and we would just want to get to know you. So share things about yourself in an authentic manner. Like if you have questions, um, you know, if you have like things that uh, you find would resonate with that person in a, in a more authentic, genuine way, like those are totally fine to bring in the professional context. You don't have to, you don't always have to be super buttoned up when you're talking to somebody and approaching them. Yeah, great point. I think that that, that uh, layer of like a, a casual vibe, not too casual of being friendly with that person can definitely like resonate with them. And I admit that I have used emojis in the past when I've made connection requests just to like, add in that casual vibe. Uh, okay, Antonio, I have a question for you specifically from Vivian. Uh, you had mentioned about strategizing during networking as an international student due to, due to the difficulties of getting a work visa. So uh, Vivian is Canadian and would like some advice on, on that as applying to US companies and how can they uh, stand out? Yeah, it's really tough because, uh, you know, no, we don't really have like a list of companies that sponsors Visa. Actually, it would be great if there was a, if such a list. Maybe I'll ask a couple of my friends to start one. But uh, basically the strategy I used, and it, it's sort of the industry standard, is sponsoring uh, international Visa is very expensive, like financially speaking. Uh, you need to hire immigration lawyers to file your paperwork for you. Uh, and bearing in mind that the work visa, which is the H-1B visa, is a complete random lottery. So there's no guarantee you'll get it. I think the success rate per year is 25%. Uh, and they only have one lottery per year. So when a company hires you, they're basically banking on that 25% rate of success three times if you have a STEM OPT uh, and once if you have a regular OPT. So that basically means uh, companies that sponsor these visas or companies that are willingly uh, hiring international students are big companies with lots of money. <laughs> uh, so when I apply for companies, uh, 
instead of applying for like small startups, I focused a lot on big companies, uh, LinkedIn being definitely being one of them. And other companies include like Facebook, Google, all of these companies have enough uh, money and immigration loyalty to support you through that process. So large corporations for sure. And since you're Canadian, I saw someone on the chat mention the TN visa. So Canadians have this special visa called TN visa that gives you work permit to work in the US. So as a Canadian, you tend to have less issues with that compared to non-Canadian internationals. So definitely leverage that during your uh, recruiting process as well. Yeah. And one thing I want to add to Antonio, I have coached people who are international students too. And um, sometimes the way you go asking about visa sponsorship is also tricky because sometimes if a company is not used to <clears throat> dealing with like OPT or the different types of visa statuses, if you start off the bat asking like, do you sponsor? It might um, make them feel like nervous about it. Or it's like, oh, I have to like, you know, initiate this expensive process. I don't know. Like, let me find out kind of thing. Um, versus being like more approaching it where it's like, you're, you're interested in the company. Um, if you do have OPT requirements kind of thing, just mentioning that, you know, you just need work authorization now, but at some point you you're interested in H1B visa. Um, and that kind of kind of opens up the opportunities for you a little bit more versus just focusing on the H1B sponsorship because um, Antonio's right, it tends to be the larger companies with a lot of money. And even what I've seen during COVID is that some of those companies who typically do sponsor might not be sponsoring right now. So, um, you know, if you have that flexibility to take a contract role first that meets the requirements for your OPT and then try to shift over to another place that will eventually do the sponsorship if that buys you time, um, that's a good approach of thinking about it too. That's great advice. So be open to contract roles, look at big companies that would have the resources to support visas. And um, in the chat, Casey offered just like words of encouragement of like, it's gonna take uh, time, diligence and patience. So you just have to keep at it. Uh, I have a question from Sherry. Uh, how do you maintain the relationship and update people with their progress without feeling like you're just talking about yourself? Yeah, I think um, it's important when, oh, so in a lot of these networking conversations too, um, sometimes when I like meet somebody for the first time, they just have like a slew of questions that they want to get through, right? An agenda and they want to learn everything. But when I come out of the conversation, I realized I actually didn't learn anything about the other person because I was talking the whole time. So it's like, oh, you know, they asked all these great questions, but I actually don't even know what they're studying or what school they go to or, you know, something like that. So I think what's important when you're having these conversations, especially when you're maintaining the relationship, keep it conversational, right? Don't just be like, oh, I've been doing all these things my semester and, you know, I did a hackathon and all this stuff and that's it. Ask the other person how they're doing, right? Like, you know, how's their career going? If there's something that you bonded with them, like travel, right? How was your last vacation? You know, just something to kind of like open it up. And, um, you know, again, find that common ground. So it feels more humanized and that uh, when you're having that conversation and I'll just make it much easier. It's totally fine to have small talk when you're doing these networking conversations. In fact, it actually helps break the ice a lot. Great point. Um, yeah, definitely making an equal conversation. Like, how are they doing? If you remember, remember something that you guys talked about previously and bringing that back up, definitely make it feel uh, more of a casual, equal conversation. Let's see. Okay, I have a question from Shaw. Uh, they asked, I, I worked as a product designer, uh, specifically in hardware for seven years. After that, I worked as a UX design uh, software for two years. So they're wondering, like, when I apply for UX positions, should I look for a position with one to two years of experience or five plus years of experience? Yeah, so I think it depends on um, the size of the organization. I mean, I can speak to it from, like I was a career shifter um, and I didn't have as much experience as you do in UX design. Um, in fact, I had like all the experience I had was just like project side work I had, project work I had done on the side in addition to my marketing job. Um, I really wanted, I was going from a senior marketing position to user experience design. And I really, really wanted, I didn't want to lose my title of seniority, especially because I shifted when I was 30. And at the age of 30, I went back to being like an associate entry level um, person. But 
what I very quickly learned is that I was really happy I wasn't put into a senior level role because I wasn't equipped to actually do the type of tasks that a senior level UX designer was required. Um, so this kind of point was re reiterated to me by my program chair who used to work at Microsoft and um, you know, her recommendation is to start um, at the, the level that best meets your needs so if, or your, your skill level. So if you have two years in user experience design, then you should go for a position that um, kind of meets your skill set. So maybe you would be coming in at an IC level um, or at a large organization, or maybe if it's a smaller organization, maybe it would be senior. Um, Christine or Antonio, I don't know if you have any other comments or feedback on that. Yeah, I think if you know if you're going specifically for a software company, um, and you know they they would probably look at your UX experience a lot more because that's directly related to the field of work that they're doing. So you might just be more at the mid level with two years. But if you're going for a company that actually does both hardware and software, um, like you know wearables, like Fitbit for example, they might actually be a little bit more open to your hardware experience too and uh, potentially giving you like a, a more like senior level position and somewhere in between. Um, so I think it's for, for your situation, it would be good to try either way anyway. So even if you see a senior position um, and you only have like two years of UX experience, it's still worth applying, right? And just like kind of seeing where that leads you um, and then, um, you know, going from there. So you have like a pretty wide range, I think. Uh, and then following, I think we have time for a couple more. So question from, I believe, Sebastian. Uh, they wanted to know more about the hackathon. So, and they asked, how much weight do hackathons and personal projects uh, uh, pull to a design manager or hiring manager? Or I guess like how much weight um, do those look like to a hiring or design manager? They can carry quite a bit. So like we organized um, a hackathon with CCA and LinkedIn, um, so we paired CCA designers with uh, um, engineering students at General Assembly, and they created these teams and they had you know, a weekend to come up with a cool project. And the winning team actually ended up using that project. This one woman used her project in her portfolio and she used that in her case studies that she was using to interview. And that actually helped her get the job. So she got the job and then took it. Um, so they can carry quite a bit of weight, um, which is wonderful. Yeah. And, and I think with that being said, though, you know, if you're a student um, and you're kind of worried about not having the time to do it, right? Like if you're going for like an internship where it's like, you know, zero years of experience, everybody else is a student kind of thing. It's fine to have, you know, um, just like self-done projects or like school projects. But you also have to realize that the competition is pretty high. So there may be other students who have internships, who've done pro bono work, who've done hackathons. And real work experience is always going to weigh out a little bit more for like recruiters and hiring managers in that mindset um, than, you know, just like pure student projects. So um, I would encourage you if you have the time to try to do some of that stuff, but does it break your experience entirely? And like, you know, if you only had student projects, like it's not impossible to land a job either. You just, it's just like maybe a little harder to differentiate yourself from other students with similar portfolios. Hopefully on, on having similar portfolios. Uh, I personally experienced a lot of cases back in school where uh, students would put two or three projects that they've done in their uh, coursework. Uh, since CMU had an HCI program, we had several courses that yields few UX projects. But what ends up happening is everyone goes to the career fair and all 80 students have exactly the same projects on the same topic. Uh, that's the worst way to sort of shine amongst your peers. Uh, so doing pro bono work, volunteering or hackathon definitely helps you stand out. Yeah, definitely that awareness of how you will compare with your cohort, with your peers. And I think another thing is like hackathons, you get to, you get to uh, talk about like you, you worked within a constraint, whether it's time constraint or working with a client. And that's going to be definitely different from a, than a student project. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's like that opportunity to work with um, people like engineers that you might not have in grad school, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. We'll end with 
the Q&A with one more question. And this is from Belle. I think they wanted to understand more about the, the types of content um, that they could create. And they asked, do you recommend starting a medium as a way to get more exposure and building content? So there are a couple ways, and Antonio did touch upon this in his section. Um, there's a couple different ways you can create content. Um, I've seen people do it in a variety of ways. Um, I personally have written, I did try um, managing Medium, but I found it was kind of a lot to do Medium and then LinkedIn and you know other channels too. Um, so actually you can write articles on LinkedIn and that's just a nice way to put your content with one ecosystem that people can easily find. Um, outside of LinkedIn, of course, like, you know, people are creating podcasts or now with Clubhouse, it's really cool. You can enjoy, uh, join in on a community and have conversations and network with people. Um, granted, I don't think that content is saved yet. I'm still like Clubhouse newbie. Um, but that's an interesting way to kind of engage in that conversation. Um, I, we've also seen people create videos, which Antonio po uh, pointed out earlier too. Um, Christine and Antonio, I don't know if you have any other ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say do what you're good at. So if you're a really good writer and you like writing, you know, then yeah, go for it. Write a, you know, write things on Medium, LinkedIn, like long form publish, like stuff like that. But if you're not, don't force yourself to it because you're going to hate it. Like um, similar to Katie, you know, I've tried writing and I'm just like, I just don't have the patience to do it. But I love doing events. I love doing mentoring. I love talking. Um, so I focus the majority of my energy doing kind of that stuff and then making my personal brand around that. Um, so I think it's important for you to find like a passion and a sweet spot too, when it comes to creating content, um, because it's going to come off too, and it's going to be conveyed in the medium that you're using. Um, so I, I would recommend you kind of starting with that. And if you don't know, experiment, just try a bunch of different things. You know, maybe you have some blog posts already out there. Just try, you know, resharing those, seeing where that goes. Uh, maybe you sign up to do a talk, you know, just something like that and just figure out what works best for you and then just kind of go with that. Cool. Format I, I saw recently is like uh, a sort of Instagram style where you create series of square uh, photos, but with content written on them. So you, you can like scroll through it and go through the whole narrative and then also showcase your work. I thought that was a really a creative format as well. Yeah, like a, like a slide. There's just so much creativity too. So yeah, there's so many opportunities to pick and explore, experiment which one that works well for you. It doesn't always have to be a, like a long form article. I, I guess those are referenced a lot, but there's definitely a lot of different formats out there. And uh, uh, I feel jealous about the Clubhouse thing because I, ha I have an Android phone and it feels, it feels super FOMO of not being able to be part of those awesome conversations on there. Um, okay, I think we're gonna end it here. So everyone, I want to, let's thank Christine, Katie and Antonio for sharing their personal stories and their strategies and their tips with us. Uh, let's give it up, thank you. There's a emoji, a reactions thing down at the bottom. Pop that up on the screen. All right. Okay, so we got two things we have to do before we end. Uh, we have to do our signature family photo selfie, and then I'm going to share a quick update at the end. So I think Shad, you'll be taking our, our family picture, everyone. Tidy up however you feel comfortable. You, yeah. Awesome. Throw up, your, throw up your peace signs. This is gonna be really quick. Uh, so the first screen's going up, so just Peace signs, uh, yeah, smile, yeah. if you want. Uh, the first screen done. And the second one's coming up. Okay, we're just gonna do the same thing. Um, one, set, go. Awesome. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Back to you. Thanks, Shad. All right, so for March, we'll be taking a, a short pause on this career success series because I hear there's going to be some super exciting uh, events coming up around that time. So definitely be on the lookout uh, for that from our ADP List leadership team. And with that, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and sharing a piece of your day with us. Be happy, be safe, and we'll see you all soon. Bye.